If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of trophies. If you're on Xbox and need some gamer score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Z Retro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Priority number one when recording. Always get yourself hydrated. Hello, my fellow Latter day Saints, Kenzie Retro, the Mormon Entertainer, here, the most inspirational Mormon in all of Asia. Welcome to another edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Uh, this week it's been another it's been another newsworthy week in the world of the uh, hang on. Hang on. It's been another newsworthy week in the world of gaming. Oh. There we go. Really need to get my keyboard fixed. I really need to get my keyboard fixed. Anyway, it's been another newsworthy week in the in the world of video games. Um, I'm gonna have like a, a mini top 10 list here that's already been compiled uh, to celebrate International Women's Day which took place yesterday. Um, top 10 LGBT women in video games. Well, top 10 LGBT women you can play as in video games. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, there's, there's rumblings of the PlayStation 5 and when that might be coming out. Uh, we've had two new games confirmed this week. One of them is hardly, hardly a shock and surprise in the form of Call of Duty Black Ops 4, which is hardly surprising. And uh, we've also got Super Smash Bros. finally coming to the Nintendo Switch. But is it going to be a port of the Wii U game? Or is it going to be a completely new game from scratch? We're just about to find out. Uh, there's also a new PUBG map. Uh, for, well, play for PUBG. We'll get more details on that as well. So we've got some pretty big stories. We've got PUBG, Black Ops 4, and a new Smash Bros game as well. And in the points and trophies section, I'm gonna be going through the secret trophies of Monster Hunter World. All that is coming up on today's edition of the podcast. Now, I'll be back in a couple of minutes, folks, because uh, I'm pretty sure something might have come through the post for me today. So I'll be back in a couple of minutes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, uh, so this is uh, so what we've got here is my latest rental from uh, Boomerang Rentals. Let's see what's in it today. What have they sent me? Ah ha ha ha! Ah yes. There we are. Forza Seven. The latest in the Forza Motorsport series. Do you think they'll have Horizon 4 announced at E3 later this year? Who knows? Anyway, it's another game that's going to keep me busy for the next few days. Anyway, while I'm on the subject of Boomerang Rentals, big shout out to those guys for, for giving such an amazing service. Packages start from as little as £3.99 a month. You sign up today, get a 21 day free trial and you get three free game rentals. And then from there, you can play some of the latest releases, including Monster Hunter World, which just came out recently. Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Fighter Z also came out recently as well. You can play those, you can rent them from the service, or and you can keep them forever at a discounted price on the, the uh, online uh, store. And there is no late fees. You can keep the games as long as you like, or like I said, keep them forever at a discounted price from the store. BoomerangRentals.co.uk the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learned anything. Tee hee hee.
and that jingle means we have had an EA screw up and oh oh it's not the screw up we were anticipating but that is such a terrible shame a shame that their servers were down oh dear EA is reporting server problems across all its major online games here's everything you need to know simple EA suck <laughs> But I suppose you guys want more than that? Well, ask and you shall receive. Right. EA, EA is still down across for people across Europe, the UK, the US and the rest of the world. Basically, it's still down across the entire world. Some players are reporting that they are able to log into Battlefield 1 in the UK, according to Down Detector, but the servers remain empty and the game will fail to connect to an online session. You see, this is what happens when you ship this is what happens when you ship broken games, EA. Battlefield 1... Let's just say one thing. This is... EA, this is what happens when you ship broken games every year. I mean, for crying out loud, Battlefield 1's been out for just over a year and a half now. And apparent And judge it by this, it's still broken! You sh con you're constantly shipping broken games... Ugh, ay ay ay. At about 9.15 UK time, the company updated players on the situation. Uh, we are terribly sorry that you're- that you cannot connect to online servers. We cannot admit the fact that we constantly ship broken games and the online servers never work for us. Yours sincerely, Electronic Arts, please give us more money. <sighs> oh, that's if EA were 100% honest with us. But, the real thing is, we are continuing to more monitor the fibre outages that are impacting connectivity to our games. And http dot slash slash help dot ea dot com. Even their own help website is down. <sighs> connectivity is intermittent and not all services are restored. We will post updates as we receive them. No, what that should say is, we will post updates assuming we can be bothered. Thank you for, thank you for wasting your money with us. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with us. <laughs> thank you, thank you for wasting your money with us. EA's rubbish team. Or should I say EA's helpless team? It says EA helped him in the article, but <laughs> those who know me well, I love to rattle on EA and how bad their business practices are. The company has offered no rough estimation because they don't want to, as to when we'll be able to see a normal service resume. Simple. They will tell they will tell us in never. In other words, to translate into English, they will never tell us. Because it's EA. They only care about green. Or blue, or red slash orange, or purple over here. As, uh, we'll keep you updated as we learn more. Uh, how about no and just... How about no updates and just fix the fix the servers, and actually ship games that are not broken, EA. It wouldn't surprise me if this happened with Anthem when it comes out. It would not surprise me in the slightest. Talking of things that are hardly surprising, we're gonna have another Call of Duty game this year, yay! And nobody cares! Oh boy. Da, 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 da. Following a great deal of speculation and apparent confirmation that 2018's Call of Duty entry would be a new Black Ops game, Activision has made it official. Hardly surprising. Call of Duty Black Ops 4 is in development and will be released later this year, though it'll be sooner than we're accustomed to. Great! It's gonna be shipped earlier, which means it's gonna be broken! Every Call of Duty game is broken, especially the online, which is, let's face it, not funny at this point. They've had an annual Call of Duty game 
since 2005. It's 2018, and you still ship the exact same game. Black Ops 4 is headed to PS4, Xbox One, and PC. There's no word on the Switch version, as some had hoped. Simple, Activision hate Nintendo. Call of Duty hates Nintendo. <laughs> Did you see how bad the port of Modern Warfare 3 was? I think it was Black Ops 2 Declassified as well, or was that for the PS Vita? There was definitely a Call of Duty game on the Wii U. Anyway, it will be released on Friday, October 12th, almost a full month sooner than the early November release window that new Call of Duty games typically occupy. As previously confirmed, this year's game is being developed by Treyarch, the studio responsible for the entire Black Ops series. Oh great, we're gonna go back into space. Fantastic, Call of Duty, fantastic. Unfortunately, beyond those basic details, Activision hasn't shared anything further about the game. Instead, a special event will be hosted on May 17th where Activision will reveal the game publicly. It's not a reveal event if you've already revealed the title of the game. If you're gonna do a reveal event, DON'T REVEAL THE TITLE! WAIT UNTIL THE REVEAL EVENT TO ANNOUNCE THE TITLE, YOU IDIOTS! You're an idiot. Thanks, Ren and Stimpy. Activision is basically Stimpy in this situation. Stimpy, you idiot! Or, or in this case, Activision, you idiots! It's unclear if we'll get any other official details prior to that date. <coughs> and it looks as if the PC version may use Blizzard's Battle.net. Oh, for peace. Oh, yeah, Activision Blizzard, of course. Blizzard have nothing to do with Call of Duty. They never have and never will. So congratulations for screwing over the glorious PC Master Race, act of failures. It was reported earlier this year that 2018's game would be Black Ops 4. Goodness sake. Activision rotates between Call of Duty studios on a three year cycle, and given the sub series popularity and the fact that 2018 marks three years since the previous Black Ops game was launched, the news made sense. Three year cycle, and they still ship the same game! Subsequently, NBA star James Harden was recently spotted wearing a hat that appeared to feature a modified version of the Black Ops 3 logo, only with four numerals, four symbols. Roman numerals be damned! That logo turned out to be real, as you can see above. Black Ops 3, meanwhile, received a surprise update with new content, leading some to wonder if it was meant to tease the possibility of a sequel. We we'll report back as Activision shares more details on Black Ops 4. In the meantime, na, 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 na. let us know in the comments. Um, how about actually shipping us a Call of Duty game that has nothing to do with anything you've done before? You've done World War II, you've gone into the future, you've gone into space with space battles that should have been in the first Star Wars Battlefront game that was made by EA. Since when did Call of Duty and Space Battles have anything to do with each other? Absolutely never! <sighs> this is one of the reasons why I stopped playing Call of Duty. Because it's the same game every year, just with a different coat of paint. Or, in that Simpsons episode, it's that it's the same doll, but it has a new hat! <sighs> and apart from that, a difficulty spike on veteran difficulty. I still haven't forgiven you for that, Activision! Never have, never will. Yeah, this is definitely gonna be a long article. This will take me a while. But anyway, here we go.
Right, so they don't have any official announcements as of yet regarding the PlayStation 5. We don't have any official announcements from Sony just yet, but there are some pretty significant rumours floating around the, at the moment. Marcus Sellers has been claiming on Twitter that PlayStation 5 development kits are already in the hands of third-party developers. Given at the same time, he correctly predicted that Nintendo would be holding a direct stream on March the 8th. Interest has been peaked. There are also talks of a Sony backwards compatibility painted. Gee whiz, about blooming time! Which has recently been updated after an original 2015 filing. Oh my goodness me. Gee whiz, rumours of backwards compatibility coming back to PlayStation. Gee whiz, about blasted time! You can't really beat the announcement of a brand new games console. The specs, the launch titles, the clamour to pre-order for the release date, it's exhilarating! And we know that when Sony announces the PS5 and the beginning of a brand new console generation, we'll hardly be able to hold it together. We also love the run-up to that announcement, with all the rumours anticipation and infuriatingly convincing fan product renders come with it. At time of rights, at time for right, but at time of writing, Sony has confirmed the existence of the PlayStation 5, and although we'd love to be able to say that's something we know will be coming soon, we can't. At the moment, it's very hard to say when exactly we might get our first look at the PlayStation 5, or PS5 as it will quickly be known as. We have PS1, PS2, PSP, PS Vita, PS3, PS4, PS5, eh, much catcher. But don't despair though, good Sony fans! While we can't be sure when the PS5 will be revealed or even announced, we do know that a PlayStation 5 will be coming eventually. Sony's president and CEO Sean Layden confirmed as much in an interview with Gollum.de. Must be German. Must have been a German website. Sure, he said it wouldn't be anytime soon, but that's better than not coming at all. Gabe Newell? Half-Life 3, anyone? Come on, Val! Why are we waiting? It's hard to fault Sony for looking before it takes the leap into the next generation of consoles. The PS4 Pro is still relatively new to the market, and its direct competitor, Microsoft's Xbox One X, is even is an even more recent release. By introducing greater power and 4K capabilities to the market, mid-generation upgrades such as these have extended the lifespan of the current generation significantly. Hmm. At that. If we're honest, we can't really see any urgent need to start a new generation right now. Probably won't be until about 2020 at least. I mean, well, that's just me. They're probably, it's probably going to be at least 2020 before Generation 9 comes out. I'm talking console generation, folks, not Pokemon. I wonder when Gen 8, talking of which, I wonder when Gen 8 is going to be revealed for, um, Pokemon. I mean, where are they going to take it after, um, uh, where are they going to take it after the, uh, Alola region now? Anyway. If we're honest, we can't really see any urgent need to start a new generation right now. And given Microsoft's growing commitment to backwards compatibility, and they're still adding games as we speak, we think it's key for Sony to re really think about its next steps. We imagine it will be another couple of years, at least before PlayStation 5 is necessary or even wanted. You have to question what exactly the PS5 could do better. Sony now has a system that's capable of both HDR and 4K gameplay, upscaled and native, which, for most gamers, is more than enough for the time being. Unless Sony has a treasure trove of 8K TVs ready to ship out exclusively with PlayStation 5 PS5 consoles, there might not be a point in launching a new system right now. If the focus is going to be on visual enhancements, but perhaps even more importantly, the console's existence and recent success has called into question whether a proper follow-up to the PS4 will ever be needed. We might be moving towards a new iterative hardware cycle. How do I pronounce it? Though Sony briefly had m the most... <clears throat> <clears throat> Though Sony briefly had the most powerful console on the market, 
with the PS4 Pro. Microsoft threw a spanner in the works in November 2017 with its Xbox One X, which is now officially the most powerful console in the world! If only I was able to reverb. Anyway, if only I was able to put reverb on that. It's too early to tell just yet, but that could spell trouble for Sony. It already has. Because the PS4 Pro can't put 4K upgrades onto games past 2016. Whereas the Xbox One X, I should say, Xbox One X, has been putting 4K upgrades onto games that are backwards compatible on the Xbox One to begin with. I mean, they've got games that were released way back in, way back when the Xbox One launched. The original, the original, the base Xbox One. When that launched, they had games like Forza 5. That's more than likely, go, hang on. Killer Instinct was a launch title for the Xbox One. And yet somehow this, and yet somehow Sony can't keep up. Thanks to Phil Spencer, the Xbox One did a complete 180 and is now on the front foot. As soon as backwards compatibility was announced at E3 2015, boom, mic drop, Microsoft were back in the game. Though Sony briefly, da, 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 da. but just because Microsoft has launched a new system doesn't necessarily mean Sony will counter immediately. Pfft, highly unlikely they will. There are good reasons to believe that Sony is less comfortable with the idea of taking a mobile phone style upgrade every year. Approach to consoles in the future, including comments from Yoshida himself. Also, it boils down to simple economics. It's well, documented that, it's well documented that the longer a console can persist on high street shelves, the more profitable it becomes. As economies, scale, as economies of scale reduce manufacturing costs, while a large install base means publishers can sell more copies of their latest games. What does that mean for the PS5? Will Sony's fifth console come to fruition? What would it do differently? What can it do differently? For now, at least, we don't have all the answers. But instead of twin, but instead of twiddling our thumbs and waiting for Sony to plop the next system on our laps, we've done some digging to try and get to the bottom of the mysteries that kept us up at night. When is the PS5 and when is it coming out? Simple. We don't know. I'm probably gonna do. I'm probably gonna do a. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna do a follow up on that article. Um, basically, reading the rest of that article, uh, either next week or at some point. Uh, at some point uh, next week. On a uh, on a trophy achievement podcast DLC, it's basically um, trophy achievement podcast. An extra episode. Well, so it'll be a mini episode dedicated to just one article, and I'll be and I'll give my thoughts on it afterwards. Anyway, if you think that's a good idea, folks, for me to do an extra mini a, a mini episode of the podcast during the week before my before my main episode on the Friday, uh, give the video a thumbs up and sound off in the comments, and also keep me up to date on the latest gaming news if you think anything is newsworthy. I think I might need, I might, I think I might need to get myself another orange, or Clementine or Satsuma, whatever you pronounce, however you want to call it. Right. Now, we've had some announcements regarding current games and new games coming out. Let's get to one of the new games coming out.
we have a reveal trailer for Super Smash Bros for the Nintendo Switch. What does help? What does help is if I actually have the set. Okay. Okay, now I can okay. Let's split you. Okay. Ah, this is where the- ah, so they've got the Splatoon characters. Whoa! Oh my! <laughs> Mario! A few moments later. Coming out later this year. Is it a new Smash game or is it a port of the Wii U Smash game? As many fans have been waiting... As many fans have been waiting for since the announcement of the Nintendo Switch. Super Smash Bros. is finally confirmed to be coming to the system and it's coming in 2018 later this year. <laughs> Splatoon Inklings are confirmed to appear in a short confirmed to appear in a short teaser shown on during the Nintendo Direct today. Mario and what appears to be Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild's link were also shown in the teaser. Several other characters can be seen in partial shadow at the end of the trailer. No official title has been set for the fighter with its working title being Nintendo Switch Super Smash Bros. The last Smash Bros game came in 2014 for Super Smash Bros, which was Super Smash Bros for Wii U and Super Smash Bros for Nintendo 3DS, two companion entries in the franchise. IGN reviewed Smash Bros for Wii U higher than Smash Bros for 3DS, though still praised both games for their impressive additions and twists on the beloved fighting series. Nintendo continued to support Smash Bros for both systems well after their debut with Amiibos, with Amiibo, new characters, and new stages added as DLC, including characters like Bayonetta. If this turns out to be a new Smash Bros game, if this turns out to be a brand new Smash Bros game from scratch, Nintendo take my money! And it looks like I may not have to wait much longer to relive some childhood nostalgia because the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy is no longer going to be exclusive to PS4. How's about that? So, last year, released last year as a PS4 exclusive, remastered versions of Crash Bandicoot, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Rex Back, and Crash Bandicoot Warped are coming to the Switch on July the 10th. And as well as Xbox One and PC. Take my money! The Crash Bandicoot series was a PlayStation exclusive when it debuted back in 1996, but these days, a Bandicoot's gotta stretch his legs. The Switch seems like a perfect place to play the remasters, which take the original level data from the original trilogy and layer on some shiny new graphics. Ooh, shiny! Announced today during Nintendo's direct presentation, the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy is due out on the Switch July 10th. An update we had an update on Mark uh, just uh, yesterday, in fact, at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Activision just announced the trilogy is also coming to Steam and Xbox One on July 10th. Woohoo! This means Crash will be making his Nintendo and PC debut 
on the same day. Whoop the gun! Do do do! Ha <laughs> ha! guy indeed! And we have the announcement trailer right here. <laughs> PS4. There we go, Nintendo Switch. Xbox One. And Steam. Crashes back again. <laughs> crashes back, crashes back again. Crashes back, crash, crash. Yes, who's back? Back again. Crash is back. Back again. Crash Bandicoot and Sentility available now. On all platforms July 10th. <laughs> There's the title. Wumpa for everyone. You get a Wumpa. And you get a Wumpa. Everyone gets a Wumpa. <laughs> Pump G's next map is... Tiny battleground. Tiny tropical island. Ooh, this will be good. So there we are. That's what the map looks like. Without these notifications getting in the way. So yeah. I'm going to say that's what... That's what the map looks like. And wow. From the concept art, it looks incredible. couple of fields I mean wow that is a pretty that was a, that's a pretty good map I have a look at it so yeah that's what the new map is gonna that's what the new map is to play on those battlegrounds jungle not snow as many hoped will be the setting for the new PUBG map Revealing plans for 2018 in a blog post today, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds creative director Brendan Green showed off the first ever look at PUBG's third map and I've just shown you it right there. Um, marked this as marked, this unnamed four by four kilometer tropical terrain is one quarter the size of Miramar and Erin Erindel, which are eight by eight, including aquatic zones. It's a much smaller map, so it should give you all a much more intense and faster paced battle royale experience. It will offer a higher player density and shorter matches. We want to we want to get it into your hands early this time around, so we can use your input to make it a great experience for everyone, writes Green. It's unclear whether the new map will also accommodate 100 players, but to mention the higher player density seems to indicate the capacity won't change much, if at all. Personally, I'd keep it at 100 players. That way you can have just going pew 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 pew! And you have players dropping like flies. Boom, 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 boom. That's basically an analogy of every single player just going down. Boom, boom, just like that. Anyway, where were we? The new map will go live on PUBG's test server next month. So we're going to wait till April for the maps to go to, for the map to go onto the test servers. That I can get behind, that's fine. Based on concept art, the new map will only have five or six zones with structures, including what looks like a hillside village that runs east to west in the northeast. Which will be uh, northeast. Northeast from my perspective, but it'll be northwest on your screen. Okay, yeah, it'll be that, it'll be round about there. Near, right about there, near the middle of the map. Right. Anyway. Um, this raises big questions about loot propagation on the map. It would be a big change for loot to spawn outside of structures. So perhaps smaller buildings aren't accounted for in this concept art. The rest of the island appears dense with vegetation across three high elevation peaks and into flatter areas closer to the coast, while terraced land lines the centre. A murky river splits the mass into three smaller isles. What will we call them? 
what would they what would they call the the islands? Ah, yeah, that's a very valid point. That is actually a very valid point. Well, haven't actually played player unknowns battlegrounds yet, but I have played Fortnite Battle Royale, which is basically similar, Con basically the same concept. So anyway, here we go. Uh, yesterday, when I put when this goes live, uh, yesterday was International Women's Day. So to celebrate that, we've managed to get a top ten of the vid top ten video games that let you play as a lesbian or bisexual woman. So here we go. Let's see what we can get. Ah. Starting off strong with the Dragon Age series. Ah, that's very good. Right. Now, whether you're a fan of the Warden, Hawk, or Inquisitor, or just all three, each game in the RPG series, Dragon Age has let you choose how to portray your sexuality with the utmost, with the utmost respect. In the same vein as Mass Effect, which we more than likely will get to in the list later. Anyway. Uh, in fact, when you're speaking about issues such as sexuality or gender in video games, it would be absolutely impossible for you to for you not to think about this beloved series by Bioware. And yes, although it is far from perfect, you cannot deny that Bioware has taken some important positive steps forward in bringing representation to the AAA games that we play. In the first game, you were able to play as a bisexual or lesbian warden, some, sometimes, depending depending if you couldn't say no to Alistair's puppy eyes or Leliana's everything. <laughs> That's an emphasis on the everything. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't, you would even find yourself in a love triangle between a male and female character. The possibility of playing a lesbian or bisexual character carries on in Dragon Age 2 with love interests Isabella, Meryl, Anders, and Fenris. No, they aren't no they aren't player sexual. As well as in as well as in Inquisition. Throughout the series these relationships are not ridiculed or made to feel lesser, and that is a fantastic feeling to have, especially if you're struggling with your sexuality. Regardless of where you stand with these three games, the Dragon Age series continues to be great and accepting. Even outside of video games, just check out their comics, you'll see what I mean. And is personally one that has helped with outstanding, uh, with understanding sexuality and gender. Next on the list. Oh my word. The Last of Us. Ah, yes, that's him. When Riley Abel and Ellie kissed in The Last of Us DLC Left Behind, a whole can of worms opened. Many felt betrayed for some reason. Others felt the Naughty Dog were trying to appeal to liberal hippies. <laughs> whatever, the, whatever in the world that's supposed to mean. And to put it bluntly, it was a mess. I would say, I would, uh, I would dare uh, read that entire sentence, but uh, for obvious reasons, there is the, um, I've got to keep it family, I've got to keep it family friendly, because I'm a member of church. It was a mess. Even though all the fight, even through all the fighting, I couldn't help but think that everyone was just missing the point. Even though it was right in front of their very eyes. People were happy, watching, struggling. Watching struggling, confused girls tweet about how happy they were to see something that they felt they related to, but didn't know how, but didn't know how was so very humbling to hear about. And while I hadn't played The Last of Us at the time, it affected me through other ways. Namely, a best friend texting at goodness knows what time, yelling about how Ellie kissed a girl. Ellie kissed a girl! Oh my word! Ellie kissed a girl! No way, man! Was it awesome? You bet it was! There's, there's just some sort of euphoria that you can't beat at seeing people you love happy like that. I'm so grateful that Naughty Dog in included such a wonderful character, and I can't wait to see more of Ellie in the sequel. Neither can I, good sir! Or madam. Neither can I. 
Anyway, next. Stardew Valley next. Oh, okay, 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 get the hundred. Okay, so let's see what we have. Chucklefish really knew it had a winner on its hands when it published Concerned Apes Farm Adventure Game Stardew Valley. While Stardew Valley does not push the romantic aspects involved in the game in your face, in your face, uh, it is a brilliant little feature that allows you to create yourself or your original character, to each to their own, in your mind's image. And sure, you spend most of your time farming and smacking rocks to get some of them sweet minerals, but that doesn't stop you from falling in love with one of the residents that live in the valley. There is a huge selection to choose from, regardless whether you play as a lesbian or bisexual. In fact, you get all love interests. You lucky bisexual lady, you. <laughs> all of them are touching in their own way, as you can see above. Abigail was a personal favourite of mine. What's more, Stardew Valley treats the relationships with the same amount of respect as it would a heterosexual one. But even if you don't fall in love with the lovely bachelors or bachelorettes, the game is sure the game is sure to win you over. So do check it out. Yeah, I'll just have to check it out at some point. Ah, life is strange and life is strange before the storm. Ever since Life is Strange came out in 2015, the diverse fan base of women has been phenomenal. Do 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 do. Phenomenal do 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 do. Phenomenal do 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 charging by the tech. <laughs> I don't think I know a fan base, excluding BioWare's, that is as passionate and fervent about these characters than the Life is Strange one. And after playing both of these games, as well as the fan as well as the fan made visual novel Love is Strange, ooh, it's easy to see why. In the original Life is Strange, you follow the life of Max Clo Clo Caulfield, a young woman who has finally made her way back home to Arcadia Bay, where she discovers she has secret powers. Time travel! Doug Brown! Thank you! While this is just one of the fascinating aspects of Life is Strange, the reason why this game is included on the list is Max's relationship with her best friend Chloe Price. There is an option to kiss Chloe in episode 2, where Max can also hint at her feelings for Chloe. This then continues to develop through diary entries and interactions between the two that are inherently romantic by nature. While the ending of the original left many feeling bitter, to me there's just one thing to say. Bay, B-A-E, is better than Bay, B-A-Y. Now, as for Life is Strange Before the Storm, you play as Chloe Price, who is incredibly different from Max in many ways. What isn't different, however, is that you too can confess your feelings to the person who sweeps you off your feet, a beautiful girl known as Rachel Amber. Wasn't Rachel Amber mentioned in the first Life is Strange game? What, uh, Rachel recip reciprocates these feelings and many other characters involved in the story make mentions of yours and Rachel's relationships with one another. It's an incredible game, just remember to keep the tissues handy. Remember to keep the tissues at hand. For the tears, obviously, and not the other thing, boys. But mind you, it is talking about women. Anyway. Dishonored 2. Ooh, excellent. While Dishonored 2's trailer came out, when Dishonored's bleh, sorry, when Dishonored 2's trailer came out, I'm pretty sure I heard at least 10% women in the world suddenly declare they just felt a little less heterosexual. Which is great, because the protagonist, Dishonored 2, in Dis of Dishonored 2, Emily Caldwin, was confirmed to be bisexual through the game's co-creator Harvey Smith. Kudos to you, Harvey, you LGBT supporting legend. Considering Emily's love letters to Wyman, a character who has purposely been left gender ambiguous, I'd say it would be too far. F I say, uh, bleh, I'd say it wouldn't be too far-fetched to consider Emily for this list. Though, if you're nitpicking at this already, Cinema Sins, GCN, Christian Miracle, I'm looking at all of you for nitpicking everything. Uh, uh, uh. Consider this, Megan Foster, aka Billy Lurk, 
through the campaign, you learn more and more about Billy, including her female lover. Ooh, interesting. While this ends tragic tragically, Billy has recently appeared as a main protagonist in the game Dishonored Death of the Outsider. So wait, Death of the Outsider isn't just an expansion, it's a standalone game as well? And while, and while, while, while Delilah isn't a playable character, like Emily or Billy slash Megan, we can't forget the lesbian coven of witches that has, that she has at her back, at her beck and call. What a power move. <clears throat> Especially my, my, my Delilah. <sighs> <clears throat> I really need to work on that Tom Jones number. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I mean, the opportunity, the article presented the opportunity and I took it with both hands <clears throat> and both sets of vocal cords. Anyway, uh, Pyre next. If there's one game that deserves commend commendation for its take on sexuality and love, then it's Pyre. Supergiant's RPG slash sports game Pyre is a masterpiece in storytelling, particularly when it comes to the characters you all come to know and love. These characters can form relationships with one another, friendship or romance, and you can help them through certain choices you make throughout the game. But don't worry, you don't have to be the love guru for everyone else. You can also help yourself in that department too. There are instances where your character can flirt with the other women in the wagon, such as Pamitha, a harp, Pamitha, a harp, and Jodariel, a demon. Unfortunately, none of these go anywhere as Pamitha, as Pamitha doesn't take your affections seriously, while Jodariel just simply doesn't see you that way. Feels bad, doesn't it? Hmm. But, but wait, there's hope in the name of Sandra the Unseen. Sandra is a wraith trapped in the Beyonder Crystal and has been and has been for nearly a thousand years. Yet her and you, the reader, can become close, right to the point where Sandra confesses her fears and feelings about you abandoning abandoning her. It's her heart wrenching it's heart wrenching, but the ending where you stay together more than makes up. For it. Not now, Pentatonix. Oh, the drawbacks of recording the podcast. Anyway. Prey? As in... As in the reboot or the original? Morgan U. Let me double check that one. Hmm. Ah, yes. Female. No, the, it's the reboot that came from last year. Anyway, 10 video games that they did not win. Hang on. One of the main problems is the lack of diversity when it comes to the people of color in video games especially women of colour who are also part of the LGBT community. So you can imagine my surprise and glee at playing Morgan Yu as a lady and discovering that she was previously in a relationship with another woman. And sure, Prey isn't exactly about love, rainbows and smooching, so Morgan's relationship with Chief Engineer Michaela Michaela Iushin doesn't go well. But even something as small as this can mean a significant amount to the right people, and certainly meant a lot to me. So even if you aren't impressed by how little LGBT content there is in the game, support Prey because it most certainly deserves it. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Ah, yes. I think that was nobody that The Witcher was going to make an appearance here. Anyway. Ciri is the badass time traveller who won our hearts back when she first appeared in the video game realm of The Witcher in its final establishment, Wild Hunt. Wait, 
What? Final establishment. Final establishment. Hang on. Ah, it's just the end of the trilogy. That's what it is. It's the end of the trilogy. That's what it is. As she is just a little too busy running for her life from the pursuing wild hunt. Roll credits! Serious sexuality doesn't get through, get brought up a lot of times, yet if you read under the Zedge Sap Sapkowski's Witches novels. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I am very sorry if I pronounced it wrong. You'll soon discover that Siri has got her eyes on both the ladies and men. Lucky them. Nudge, nudge. She even gets a tattoo of a red rose to match her girlfriend's missile. And who said romance was dead? While it isn't mentioned abundantly in the game, there is a scene in the sauna where women ask Siri about men. In this scene, you have the option to say, actually, I prefer women, which will lead to some interesting reactions. None of them bad, thankfully. If you look extra hard, you can also see Siri's rose tattoo on her thigh, showing that missile still means a lot to her. Interesting. Very interesting. Number nine, Overwatch. Oh my word, that's a graphic image. Um, that's not subtle at all. Moving on, that's not subtle. That's not subtle at all whatsoever. Anyway, anyway, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, let's get to the. Okay, anyway. Overwatch's traces. Overwatch's Tracer's epic come out in the comic Reflections was almost as bad as the trash fest as Ellie as Ellie's in terms of fan base feedback. But again, who actually cares? Like I said, I'm trying to keep it fun. Anyway, Overwatch is an FPS that many players in the world enjoy. Me included, even though I haven't got a copy of the game yet. Anyway, the game has a dedicated fandom and its very own league. With, with such a huge, diverse fan base, it would be silly of Blizzard to not include characters that the LGBT community could connect with. So in came Tracer, the poster girl of the series. She is the first LGBT character to be revealed in re, to be revealed to Overwatch's community, but Blizzard has reassured she most certainly won't be the last. All I'm going to say is this. Let it be sombre. Anyway, the last game in this list of games you can play as a, an LGBT woman. The Mass Effect series. And I knew that would be there, but right at the top. I'm still not quite forgiven by where for not allowing my shepherd to romance Miranda or Jack. But it's, but it's, whatever. I guess I'll romance, romance Liara. Again. Unlike the Dragon Age series, Bioware's sci-fi drama hasn't been the best when it comes to lesbian or bisexual women. Often stating facts about their lore, just search a sorry lore, you'll get what I mean. And then changing it. Ugh, you don't change the lore on the dime. Did I say lore? Does that, does that say law or law? You don't change the law on the dime. But even if Mass Effect's original trilogy wasn't perfect, <coughs> Mass Effect 3's ending, <coughs> EA, we never forgive you for that! Blame the publisher for interfering with the studio. Never blame the studio. Always blame the publisher. Because if you blame the developer, it will demoralize them, 
whereas if you crit whereas if you blame the publisher it means that the developers have something to defend with should they file a lawsuit anyway But even if Mass Effect's original trilogy wasn't perfect when it came to giving us options that weren't Liara, Andromeda's romances made up, up for a lot of that. Veteran Nix's romance, a female Turian gun wrangler, basically a female Garrus, with sister Ryder, has to be one of my favourite romances that I played last year. And that was with no love scene. But even if you didn't really feel the love of Vetra, there were more options with the Asari PB, despite that love scene, and the dorkiest lady alive, Suvi Anwar. While Andromeda may have failed in a lot of other ways, it gave me enough lady love to, to last a 50 hour playthrough, and hence why you should give it a try. I need to start playing Andromeda again, it's been a long time since I've played it. Time for the best part of the show, apart from the EA screw up of the week, and it goes a little something like... Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting, points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. <laughs> so yeah, Monster Hunter World came out uh, at the end of uh, January, around about the same time as the Dragon Ball Fighters Z. So. There are 50 trophies all together, and now it's time to go through the secret trophies. The secret trophies. No secret gold trophies, which is, which is a bit of a shame. So anyway, <clears throat> here we go. So, the bronze secret trophies are as follows. Welcome to the new world. Earn the right to take on two star assignments. The, the Empress of the Highlands. Earn the right to take on seven star assignments. Temper, tem, temper, temper. I wouldn't dream of challenging you. Pity, why not? Well, because the, well, because the writers well, because with regards to the Lion King remake, uh, they decided to remove the one song that made me who I am, and that song being Be Prepared. HOW DARE YOU BOTCH THE REMAKE BEFORE IT'S EVEN COME OUT, DISNEY! Anyway. Hunt your first tempered monster. One shall stand, one shall fall. Earn the right to take on eight star assignments. Nothing stops this commission. Earn the right to take on three star assignments. Into the deep. Earn the right to take on five star assignments. Defender of Astera. De earn the right to take on four star assignments. And de death begets life. Successfully guide Zora Mad Magdaros. Magdaros. Okay. Zora Magdaros. Okay. And now the Silver Secret Trophies. The Sapphire Star, solve the mystery of the Elder Crossing, snuggles for all, capture a fluffy snuggly creature that is so cute! <laughs> rainbow Bright, capture a creature that glitters like a rainbow. Ooh, pretty! Indomitable, hunt 50 tempered monsters. Bristles for all, capture a stiff bristly creature. Ooh, that sounds pleasant. And a living fossil, capture a fish known as the Living Fossil. And of course, unlock all the trophies for Monster Hunter World to get the elusive Platinum Trophy! Conqueror of the New World. And now, on that note, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. If you enjoyed the news I reported on, hit the thumbs up, and if you want to fo keep following what I do on my channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom, click the bell to join the notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on the channel. By clicking that bell, it turns on all notifications so you know when my videos go live. 
On the left, you've got uh, yesterday's video, which was Pac-Man World. And on the right, my dedicated Trophy Achievement Podcast playlist. So, with all that in mind, I will see you guys again very soon. Tomorrow, more Tom and Jerry sins with episode 2, The Midnight Snack. I will see you guys tomorrow for that. Have a fantastic day. Peace out and stay faithful.